Okay, so I think we're going to start. Uh, my name is Yann Duval. I'm the Chief of Trade uh, Policy and Facilitation at uh, UNSCAP. A uh, very uh, warm welcome to this working session on tailoring uh, trade provisions to crisis uh, to enhance resilience. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, excited and pleased uh, to, to have this session. Uh, this marks um, the, the end, uh, at least a major milestone of uh, the global initiative on model provisions for trade in times of crisis and pandemic in regional and other trade agreements that was started last year, uh, really at the beginning, uh, rather at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, when uh, several of us uh, started wondering, realized that countries were um, imposing um, and putting in place ad hoc uh, trade measures uh, that were uh, not necessarily uh, very useful uh, for themselves or for uh, other trade partners, right? As they're trying to cope with the COVID-19 crisis. And the question that came up is, is really, uh, how can countries put up such uh, and so many uh, ad hoc uh, trade measures uh, when there are already, uh, you know, the WTO agreements, but also uh, hundreds of regional trade agreements out there. Uh, so it took us, um, uh, it, it, it took us a little bit of time, but we started looking at, at the different regional trade agreements to find out uh, to what extent uh, regional trade agreements were providing guidance uh, on uh, how to deal uh, with, with, with trade uh, in a pandemic situation, a crisis situation. And unfortunately, there is very little uh, in existing regional trade agreements on that matter. And so that started the global initiative uh, on model provisions for trade in times of crisis and pandemic. Uh, and I'm very, uh, very, uh, very happy to report that there was really a lot of enthusiasm uh, by uh, not only uh, UN organizations uh, that participated, but also uh, from WTO colleagues uh, and from uh, academia, from private sector, from civil society, um, and who all contributed greatly uh, during the initiative through a policy hackathon first. Um, where we collected a lot of uh, inputs and ideas on, on what kind of provisions uh, would be needed uh, to make trade more resilient uh, in, in RTAs in times of crisis. And then uh, later on uh, to put together um, a handbook on um, uh, options uh, for provisions uh, in, in trade agreements, right, in times of pandemic and crisis. And so I'm very uh, happy to report that um, today, actually, we've, uh, we're releasing uh, this, uh, the handbook. It's a 200 page uh, handbook. Uh, providing um, information about options uh, that uh, trade negotiators and, and other stakeholders have um, um, to, uh, to better design uh, regional trade agreements and other trade agreements for, uh, for crisis. So it's out now. Uh, and then um, uh, we, we, have, we have four panelists uh, today uh, in the working sessions uh, who were actively involved uh, throughout the initiative and uh, in the development of the handbook. So we have Katrin Kuhlman, uh, from uh, Georgetown University, uh, Steve Olson from uh, Heinrich Foundation, uh, Deborah Helms from the Asian Trade Center, and uh, Bipul Chatterjee from Cuts uh, International, uh, who, all had, uh, who all had some, uh, some different roles uh, in, uh, in the initiatives. So uh, what we're going to do uh, in the working session is, is first, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, Katrin, uh, who is the main author actually of the handbook, uh, walk us through uh, the uh, the handbook. So maybe we can start with that, and then we'll we'll have uh, uh, Stephen, uh, Deborah, and and Bipul coming in with their thoughts on on how we can uh, further tailor uh, provisions uh, to crisis in regional and other trade agreements. So maybe Catherine, uh, I give you the floor. Thank you, Jan. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and pull up the slides, which now I don't see. Um, so. We can see you, but not the slides at this stage. Just one moment. I don't know what happened to them. So one second. Hmm. OK. Um, Probably you're going to see something else here for a moment, and then I just will go to the slides. Here we go. Apologies for that. <laughs> I don't know where they went. Okay. Um, now you can see them though, correct? 
Um, I can't see them. Um, I can see your screen, uh, but maybe it's because I have a little bit of delays on my screen. It, uh, Anybody else can see the, the slides? I can see it, but it's distorted. It's coming. Oh, goodness. I don't know what to do. Let's see. Um, no, let's try. Is that better? Yes, much better. Good. Now it's, okay. I don't know good. what just happened. So that was a first for me on Zoom. But um, well, it's wonderful to be here and really excited to have this opportunity to present the handbook, which, as Jan said, has launched today. This has been. Um, work that has gone on over um, a number of months um, that I have done with a team of former students and um, recent law graduates. And I want to, to speak today about what's in the handbook and why we did this. Um, and my team started working on this during the hackathon that Jan mentioned. So we have been part of the process. Um, since uh, since it was launched in, in many ways and, and really have appreciated being part of this. I think it's just been such a great initiative. So the handbook, um, as, as Jan mentioned, we did this in the midst of the pandemic, um, looking at important lessons that were highlighted during the pandemic for the system of global trading rules. And I think that although the trade rules that we have in place did help buffer the effects of the pandemic to some extent, we really saw that the current system of rules is not equipped to deal with a global crisis. We saw a lot of unilateral measures, Jan mentioned this, and I think that those really tested the boundaries of some of the exceptions and justifications that we have all you know, come to know of the global trading system over the years, but have never seen anything quite like this, where so many countries were resorting to unilateral measures at the same time. And in many cases, we saw instances where the rules just did not exist to deal with what was happening. This is, of course, all going on at the same time that vulnerabilities in the global trading system are increasing more broadly, and the WTO is going through reform. Um, you know, the discussion has, I think, rightly focused on widening systemic inequalities, increasing economic diversity, technological change. Um, and at the same time, we have RTAs, regional trade agreements that are proliferating. Um, they've been a vehicle for deeper integration. They've been used for quite a long time, but they are proliferating, I think, now at a, quite a pace. Sometimes they include WTO plus commitments. And sometimes they touch on issues that the WTO has yet to address, such as environmental protection, competition, digital trade, gender, labor. Um, these are WTO beyond, WTO extra, or WTO X issues. And so the handbook was really designed to present options for negotiators, policymakers, and other stakeholders to think about as RTAs are designed in the context of crisis, hopefully leading to greater resilience in the rules and deeper multilateral engagement as well. So it has nine chapters. Um, we have chapters on trade and essential goods and services, trade facilitation, SPS and TBT, intellectual property rights, digital trade, transparency, development, and building forward better. And of course, my colleagues will cover some of these issues in greater depth, but I'll just touch on what is in the chapters. And first wanted to just speak a little bit to the methodology behind the handbook. So in all cases that we could, and we could not do this in every case, we tried to identify a baseline option. The baseline option was something um, that encompassed minimum standards that have broad support. Many of the baselines are track very closely with provisions in the WTO covered agreements. And I think that this really highlights the strong connection between regional and multilateral trade rules. In some cases then we um, identified baseline plus options. Now, these are options that go beyond the minimum standard, but they do so in a way that is both tailored to crisis and does not undermine global norms. And further, they do so in a way that really balance the needs of different stakeholders. So we also identified discretionary options. And those are options that go beyond the baseline as well, expanding policy space, but sometimes they do it in a way that compromises the interests of certain parties at the expense of others. And we really wanted to highlight these because I think in a time of crisis, when you have different actors acting, different states acting unilaterally, it is really important to think about how policy space is exercised. In some cases, digital trade, for example, we could not identify a baseline. There's no consensus. There's quite a bit of 
divergence in the rules. So here we looked at common elements and example options. And then in other cases, there was no baseline. There really was nothing that existed, as I mentioned, and there we identified sample provisions, sample model provisions. So language that could be incorporated into regional trade agreements, sometimes building off of existing provisions, but in often, in many cases, actually creating um, possible provisions where they don't exist. And I should note that a lot of the things that are in the handbook were drawn from the contributions to the policy hackathon on model provisions for trade in times of crisis and pandemic. Um, these were you know, contributions by a number of different authors. We listed some at the end of the presentation um, in the uh, sources, but there are many more in the handbook. And so uh, those hackathon contributions really did inspire the handbook and support the handbook in many ways. So I'm just going to walk through the chapters very, very briefly. Um, and as I said, they cover some of the most pressing areas covered by RTAs in the context of crisis. They don't cover everything yet, and I'll, I'll end with that. Where does this go next? Um, the first chapter is on the pandemic and how countries responded. And here, of course, there's been a lot of really interesting analysis and data, um, which we tried to highlight. So we looked at how countries have dealt with the crisis, you know, drawing from literature and analysis. And one of the things that we did draw upon was the work of, of Simon Evanett and others, um, uh, Richard Baldwin. So here is a diagram from um, Simon Evanett, um, Evanett and Fritz that looks at how some of the measures uh, that had been undertaken, how, they, how, would you, how you would classify them. So some of them, the red on the diagram, um, shows harmful interventions. Now, not all of the interventions were harmful. I think they estimated that out of the um, over 1,370 measures taken during the first 10 months, um, that 10, 000, or 1,067 were harmful. Um, these include temporary export bans, licensing requirements, restrictions on vaccines. But again, they weren't all harmful. So some of them in the green here were actually liberalizing interventions, which was really interesting as well. The second chapter of the handbook focuses on essential goods and services. And we thought this was such an important area to cover. One, because we don't have definitions of what this means. We don't have a definition of essential goods. We don't have a definition of essential services. And so we looked at different approaches to essential goods, you know, further um, measures on export restrictions, how to deal with rules of origin, and then also integrated essential services with options on procedural liberalization of cross-border movement of natural persons, an area that I think deserves much further assessment and analysis, mutual recognition of qualifications and crisis specific responses. And on these slides, I did just wanna highlight some of the examples that we used. I will not read these out, but here, this is a baseline plus option. Again, something go that goes beyond the kind of common standard. And this is taken from language from the G20 um, that is tailored to limiting export restrictions in emergency situations. So this is an example of something that could be incorporated into a trade agreement going forward, that they be targeted, proportionate, transparent, and temporary, and not create unnecessary barriers to trade or disrupt global supply chains. The third chapter then focuses on trade facilitation, um, obviously a very important area um, during the crisis and, and ensuring that supply chains are really working across borders. Here we focused on how to streamline cross-border trade during a crisis, including options for expediting and simplifying border processes. Obviously there was a lot to draw on from the WTO trade facilitation agreement, but we tried to think in particular about how some of these measures would operate during a time of crisis. We looked at digitalization of border procedures, including adopting systems for electronic payments and documents and electronic single window systems. Again, going beyond what was already there. Um, and also looked at ways in which to address some of the implementation challenges that have arisen, as well as additional ways to simplify border procedures, improve access to information, facilitate shipments and expedite release of essential goods. And so this chapter does track with the chapter before on essential goods too. These chapters all do interconnect. So the two examples here are on accepting electronic copies for pre-arrival processing, really making sure that those are accepted um, in every case and how to do pre-arrival processing in an emergency situation. And the second one here is an example of sample draft language, um, again, tied to essential goods. 
that could be useful in, in looking at further RTAs. So again, I will not read these examples, but did want to include some of them just to highlight what's in the handbook. The next chapter is on SPS and TBT. And a lot of the measures that, are that were taken during the pandemic or have been taken during the pandemic are SPS and TBT measures. Here we looked at risk assessment, mutual recognition, simplification of procedures, and capacity building that would be particularly relevant in a crisis context. And because these measures were so important and so, or I guess so popular, I should say, during the pandemic that we thought that it was really important also to look at transparency and how they were notified. And one of the examples that we um, highlighted in the chapter here too is from the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement on reporting, monitoring, and eliminating non-tariff barriers. We thought this was a really interesting innovation. So we did try to highlight innovations from different trade agreements. Um, this would be a baseline plus option. Again, this is not a common standard, but this is something that appears at least in trade agreements to monitor and measure and deal with um, non-tariff barriers that come up. So the next chapter um, focuses on intellectual property rights. Um, obviously, again, a very, very important area. And here we wanted to highlight the flexibilities that already exist under the WTO TRIPS agreement, um, and in particular focus on the compulsory licensing commitments. Um, we also discussed, of course, the different perspectives regarding the proposal for a broader IP waiver to improve access to COVID-19 vaccines and looked at possible approaches for encouraging innovation while addressing a broad range of countries' needs in the context of the global health crisis. So one of the examples that we have from the handbook here is sample draft language on intellectual property rights pooling, um, which is something that has not been done in a regional trade agreement yet, but is one of the proposals that has been put out there and could be integrated into future RTAs. Digital trade, obviously, again, another really important area, and we'll cover this in greater detail um, during our session today. We saw a real exponential growth in digital trade um, during the pandemic. This is obviously a trend that has been going on, um, but was really, I think, very pronounced during this time um, over the last year and a half. Um, but there's not yet a consensus on global rules. And regional trade agreements are taking on this issue more and more with provisions on cross-border data flows, data privacy, electronic transactions, and consumer protection. But there's quite a bit of diversity in these approaches. And for that reason, we could not identify a baseline. So we only included example provisions in this chapter, but we did in some cases highlight the importance of certain approaches during crisis such as reliable data privacy and open cross-border data flows when access to medical information is critical. And we highlighted additional elements like digital inclusion, because this has also become something that we've really seen is incredibly important. Um, an ongoing challenge that has been exacerbated by the pandemic um, with a spotlight on the digital inclusion provisions in the DEPA, um, which is the language here in the box, which could be a model for future RTAs and something that could influence multilateral rules as well. So then we move from this to transparency. And transparency is something that came up in a number of the chapters, but we thought that it was important to devote an entire chapter just to transparency. This is the publication of measures, accountability, information sharing. We also, again, looked at ways in which states could pool information and dissemination. Um, and we looked at that at the WTO level, the regional level, the national level, trying to look at some of the practices that have been adopted in different ways in which this could be done. And clearly this is a, an area where regional trade agreements could obligate states to notify certain measures in an expedited manner. That's one of the things I think that we did wanna highlight that during an emergency publication during a certain period of time, which is what the sample draft language here highlights, can be particularly important. We also then of course have a chapter on development. And this is something that I focus on a lot in my work. I feel like this chapter only sort of scratches the surface. There's much more that we could really do here. This is also going to be part of our conversation today, which I'm really pleased with. And here we looked at a couple of different aspects. We looked at differentiating among countries with particular needs 
There's been a lot of discussion around how to differentiate between countries, but here we really took a needs-based approach to how to differentiate. Transitional time periods, obviously an element of special and differential treatment, technical assistance and capacity building and aid for trade, something else, of course, that has been on the agenda for a very long time, but again, looking at it particularly in the context of crisis and sustainable development, which is a, an emerging trend in regional trade agreements. So the language here that we showed was um, from the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, again, on differentiating between, between different countries with different needs, different levels of economic development, individual specificities, individual needs, um, and how that could be incorporated on more of a case-by-case -case basis um, into approaches. I think this is consistent with some of the approaches that we've seen at the WTO level, but we did want to highlight language from existing regional trade agreements as well. And then finally, our last chapter is on building forward better. And this really recognizes that there are so many other issues that are important in the context of um, dealing with crisis through trade rules. So these are some of the things that we thought needed further study. This is the first step at looking at some of these emerging issues, and this will be elaborated on now in other iterations of this work. So we're already sort of started on phase two of addressing some of these issues through some deeper study. One is investment. We've already seen quite a bit of, um, uh, you know, quite a bit of focus on investment in regional trade agreements, but also recently a lot of debate around this too, and how regional trade agreements balance between investor protection and a state's right to regulate and how this is particularly um, important in the context of a crisis. Movement of people, I already addressed a bit. We covered this in the essential goods and services chapter, but again, I think further, um, further focus is needed here. Labor was another issue, and this is something that does come up in a lot of regional trade agreements um, and is a trend that is likely to continue, but hopefully this will be done in a balanced way. And so we really want to bring some of those examples forward um, as we continue to go move ahead with this work. Environment, similarly, again, is coming up in a lot of regional trade agreements, um, linking to multilateral environmental agreements and other issues like circularity. Um, but I think then again, you know, questions come up about around how to do this in an ambitious way and also take countries' needs into account and ensure that stakeholder input um, is part of the process. Um, another trend that is emerging is to focus on small and medium-sized enterprises in regional trade agreements. And looking at this in the context of issues like trade facilitation, digital trade, and transparency. And so here we just, again, covered it very briefly in this chapter on building forward better, but we'll be looking into this um, in greater depth. And then finally, last but definitely not least, is gender and how trade agreements um, could likely continue this trend of looking at enhanced gender specific and gender sensitive provisions. Some of the ideas out there are to, to consider a possible Article 20 style gender exception and incorporation of minimum legal standards consistent with some of the approaches in these other areas that I've just touched on. Um, and how maybe there could be a combination of soft law and binding commitments. So gender is something um, that we will also uh, be incorporating into uh, a future, you know, into future iterations. And the last thing that I want to say is that this handbook is meant to be a living document. This was not something that we intended to release and have it um, fully capture everything. This is a discussion, a dialogue um, that needs to continue and things will change. So we will update the handbook as they do. So I think that is all that I wanted to share here are some of the illustrative sources, including some of the great papers from the policy hackathon. And hopefully that just gives a taste of what's in the handbook. Thank you again. Thank you uh, very much. Catherine, um, I'm sharing here. I mean, for giving us uh, an overview of the of the handbook. So again, uh, this handbook is a, is a uh, really uh, a cooperation between many different agencies and, and large group of, of, of people. Um, and so I encourage uh, everyone to take a look. Uh, if you can see my uh, my slide here, uh, you can see two QR codes, right? There is one QR code that you can use uh, and then to access the handbook directly. And then the, the next QR code next to it uh, is uh, the online course. So you can access an online course that is based on the handbook uh, that you can uh, take. Uh, you've got more videos from uh, Katrin Kuhnman going through a lot of details through different chapters. 
um, and then you can take a quiz and then get a certificate uh, later on. So you're all encouraged to start taking advantage of those resources because they, and they've been issued um, made available just today. So now for the rest of the panel, uh, we have uh, three um, uh, eminent uh, trade experts who've actually were part of the core group of experts who, who advised on the on the handbook, right? So we had an all-star team of advisors for the handbook. And so we have three of them uh, with us today. So maybe we can start with uh, uh, Steve uh, Olson from Heinrich Foundation to give us uh, maybe your, your view and your perspective on, on uh, some of the issues that are included in the handbook and what do you feel uh, maybe is most important from your uh, experience, uh, decades of experience in trade and trade negotiation. Uh, Stephen? Sure. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Jan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, or, or good morning, or good evening, as the case might be. Um, I know for, for two of our panelists, it's the middle of the night for them, so I'm not quite sure uh, what the appropriate greeting is for them. But um, in any event, uh, on behalf of the Heinrich Foundation, I'd like to thank uh, UNESCAP for organizing today's session. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Now, although it's still sometimes uh, hard for me to believe, we have all been living through and suffering through the coronavirus pandemic for more than a year and a half now. But what's perhaps uh, even more disheartening is the fact that epidemiologists are telling us that, look, coronavirus is unlikely to be the last zoonotic pandemic we face. And in fact, as human beings continue to encroach on natural habitats, it's virtually inevitable that new zoonotic disease strains will develop, each one with the potential to develop, unfortunately, into a pandemic. Now, traditionally, trade agreements and trade negotiators did not think at all about pandemics, about managing the implications uh, from, uh, from pandemics, and for reasons we can well understand. It's been 100 years since the last one. But obviously, today, we're in a completely different world. It's a whole new ballgame, and trade agreements have to evolve to keep up with these, with these current day realities. And so I think uh, UNESCAP really deserves a, a tremendous amount of credit for uh, organizing this initiative. And I think Katrin in particular uh, deserves recognition for really doing the heavy lifting on the drafting of the, of the handbook. I think it's a real uh, substantial contribution. Um, at the same time, however, I think it's important that we recognize the challenges that we face and some of the limitations that we face. Now, as a, a former trade negotiator myself, um, it absolutely breaks my heart to have to admit this, but the reality is not every problem in the world can be solved by a trade agreement. And so during times of crisis, during pandemics, when national leaders are facing situations literally with life and death consequences, they're gonna do whatever they think is best. And they're not gonna be overly concerned with what a particular uh, a trade agreement might say. And I, and I think we do ourselves a disservice if we don't acknowledge, hey, this is, this is the real world and this is real life. Nonetheless, the, the, the handbook is a very, very, very substantial contribution to building greater resiliency into trade and our trade systems in times of pandemics and substantially improving our preparedness so that we can get through um, uh, these pandemics. Now, as, as Katrin walked through, the, the, the handbook is full of uh, a large number of, of very, very useful um, uh, suggestions and proposals. I, I'd like to just highlight briefly three that really jumped out at me. And the first one is transparency. So of course, the WTO and most RTAs contain transparency provisions of one type or another. Uh, the basic idea is for uh, trade partners to provide their counterparts with timely notification and detailed information when they make policy changes, regulatory changes, administrative changes that could affect the way uh, trade is uh, conducted. So companies uh, can then plan accordingly and ensure that trade uh, continues to flow smoothly across the border. Unfortunately, um, in too many cases, these transparency provisions have been treated a little bit like window dressing. They look nice on a piece of paper, but honestly speaking, they haven't always been implemented 
as strongly as we would as we would hope. Now, in times of pandemic, a lackadaisical approach like this towards transparency can be disastrous. If critical supplies, med uh, medicine, medical supplies, vaccines are getting hung up in customs or moving more slowly through customs than they should be because importers or exporters haven't been notified of last minute changes or emergency uh, policy or administrative shifts that have been uh, uh, made, the results obviously can be, uh, uh, can be disastrous. And so we really need to, uh, in, our, in our RTAs, buttress and strengthen these transparency provisions, and in particular, make sure that they are enforced and they're taking more seriously than frankly they have in, in a lot of cases to, to date. Um, the, the, the second area I'd like to talk a little bit about is, is trade facilitation. Um, broadly speaking, trade facilitation is about eliminating the frictions that can arise when we try to move a product from point A to point B. So this can be things like um, cutting red tape, standardizing paperwork, um, harmonizing technical standards um, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the extent possible. Now, of course, the, the 2017 WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement was a real landmark agreement that made tremendous progress on this issue. But what was a landmark in 2017, what was a high, mar high water mark in 2017, in 2021, when we're dealing with the realities of pandemic and an even greater urgency in ensuring that goods can move um, uh, smoothly through customs, now we've got to reg regard that trade facilitation agreement as an absolute minimum level basement floor. And RTAs really have to go raise the bar, go above and beyond the trade facilitation agreement, expand scope, expand coverage, and accelerate implementation. Now, one issue here in particular that I, that I like to flag, and that is for a lot of less developed countries, in order to fully implement these provisions, they are going to need technical assistance, and in some cases, they're going to need financial assistance. And so that's another very important thing that, that regional trade agreements have to cover, cover as well. Um, the, the last point that I want to uh, mention briefly is digital trade. And I'm really only gonna say a word or two because I know uh, that Deborah is gonna go into it uh, in a lot more detail. But the basic point I wanna make here is, look, we, we, we have all been suffering through a highly contagious pandemic. And we see that it has accelerated a trend that was already underway. And that is the, the endeavor of trade is shifting from a physical endeavor more and more to a digital endeavor. And we think that trend is only going to accelerate, but yet we still don't have comprehensive digital trade rules, either in regional trade agreements or in the WTO. That's something that we've really got to focus on now and move uh, forward on as a, as a much higher priority. So I think I'll, I'll draw my comments uh, to a close there. Thanks again to UNESCAP. Thanks again to Katrin uh, for all the hard work. And uh, I'll look forward to our uh, discussion during the Q&A session. Thanks very much. Thank you uh, very much, Steve. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned trade facilitation, which is very uh, dear to my heart, uh, as, as you know. Uh, we have, um, I mean, at ESCAP, we actually have uh, UN treaty uh, that was negotiated by all member states called the Framework Agreement on Facilitation of Cross-Border Paperless Trade in mm -hmm. Asia and the Pacific, which is basically WTO TFA plus. And this is really the type of, um, the type of instrument that should be to the extent possible incorporated in, in future RTAs to push the limits in, in trade facilitation. So uh, at least for Asia Pacific countries that may be very relevant. Um, let me ask uh, um, Deborah now, uh, to uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about the digital trade angle. I know she's been doing a lot of work uh, on, on this uh, lately. So uh, Deborah, and, and I have your slide, so I'm going to uh, try share, sharing your slide and you let me know whether you see them, right? Okay, I'll let you know. So I'm really happy to be here and happy to be part of this handbook book project and, and, and part of the hackathon that was related to it. I think this is an interesting way that we can both crowdsource and then 
uh, back that up with a sustained sort of attention. And I think we should use this model on other kinds of areas and not just on, you know, crisis for a pandemic or crisis in general or whatever it happens to be, because I think it worked very, very well. And I encourage everyone, please, to, to look at the handbook and to look at the submissions that actually came in under the, the original hackathon, because many of those are quite interesting. I'm going to talk very briefly about digital trade. Um, you know, it's in the handbook, but just to get get a little bit more, especially about the flavor of what's going on in Asia, I think, in the RTAs and the digital space. As Ian especially noted, and Steve as well, you know, digital matters. So digital trade is increasingly trade. Uh, and it's not just obvious trade like digital services or e-commerce goods. It's also the embedded digital elements in everything that we do today as companies and as consumers. And the more that we have digital embedded in our daily activities and in our lives and businesses and so forth, business models, the more crucial it becomes that we have a comprehensive approach. And you can see what happens when trade gets disrupted in a crisis that digital becomes even more critical. And so we've had this interesting divergence over the last year and a half, at least, of countries that have fully embraced digital and digital trade services, delivery, e-commerce goods have exploded, et cetera. And, and yet we have some governments that have become more restrictive in the digital trade space for a whole variety of reasons. And so that tension between open and closed uh, digital policies, I think, is, is growing. Uh, and I would suggest that in times of crisis, especially digital trade is crucial. And so, as, as mentioned before, we don't have necessarily a lot of digital trade rules in place. Uh, this is a, a very fast moving and fast evolving sector. And so it's difficult for governments often to catch up to where business is at. And so we end up with the real risk of regulatory fragmentation. Uh, and the consequences can be quite high of getting it wrong. And in particular, I would say the big promise of digital trade is that anyone anywhere can become a micro multinational. So you can sell goods and services or buy goods and services from anywhere, from your you know, living room or front bench or whatever it happens to be, uh, including on mobile devices. And if we don't get the digital trade landscape right, then we undermine that promise. And in times of crisis, especially, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a climate related crisis or some kind of natural disaster, all of those disrupt the trade, typical trade patterns uh, and force people to move towards digital options. Um, and so that's why it's so important to get right. Otherwise, we undermine the promise of those micro multinationals and tiny firms, small firms, remote firms, women firms, etc., who are engaging in digital trade. So the next slide just is a brief thing here just to highlight OECD data. And what I thought was interesting about this is you can see the range of policy activities. I'm not gonna get into what the chart is because we don't have enough time, but just to see that if you go through just OECD countries from the toolkit, you can see a, a tremendous range of activity in key areas. Um, and so we're not sort of clustered around a center area for digital trade. We have lots of different policy options and policy settings in different markets. The next one. I just want to bring this to the WTO for a second. I know we're talking about RTAs for the moment, but I, I do want to reflect the, the ongoing work of the WTO and the Joint Se uh, Statement Initiative on e-commerce. They've organized it, or I would organize it in part around sort of themes. And many of these themes replicate or pick up themes that are found in RTA. So we can see the beginnings um, as Catherine has mentioned, of a sort of baseline scenario and then areas where we've gone beyond that in the digital space as well. So I would say there's at least at least these five themes that are common in many RTAs uh, and in the JSI as well. The first one is on openness and openness includes a lot of different activities, data flows, localization rules, hosting rules, customs duties, et cetera, but talking about what information can flow and when. The second theme is around trust, and there's a whole lot of things that are bundled together in trust around information, protecting personal information, source code information, consumer protection, uh, limiting un, un, undisclosed uh, messages or spam. The third one, which we mentioned earlier, is on trade facilitation, and this becomes part of the digital agenda because you cannot move e-commerce goods, especially if you get stuck with paperwork requirements. And so, you know, always happy to support paperless trading wherever possible, e-signatures, authentication. We have lots of agreements that say that you should do this, but the implementation is often weak, and we really discovered the weakness in the pandemic. 
market access issues, and then a lot of other topics that come into here. So there's a whole variety of themes. And what I want to do in the next slide is just I wanted to highlight sort of three ongoing initiatives. And this slide is going to be very fast and very brief, and I apologize for that. But just to show how those themes get replicated in three different agreements. So in, in here is the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. The Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, or DEPA, which is in modules. And the last one is the Digital Economy Agreement right now in place between Australia and Singapore, but similar models coming soon to a theater near you. So next slide, then quick, quickly, um, just really highlights the sort of beginning of convergence in these three types of agreements around some of the area, some of the common areas. So commitment just off the off the base to, to facilitate digital trade, commitment on the customs moratorium, uh, non-discrimination, uh, electronic transactions framework. So there's some consistency across these three agreements. There are some that have new elements that are added like submarine telecommunications cabling systems or um, source code details or artificial intelligence. But in general, there's the beginning of this collection of themes that are replicated then in various FTAs and RTAs. Many of them are critical in times of crisis. And so what I just wanted to say, and again, I'm, I'm gonna make this very brief. I wanted to make sure that people start thinking about digital as a, not just a sort of side thing, and it's not just about data. There's a whole selection of, of materials that really need to be part of making digital trade work for everyone. And in times of crisis, it's more vital than ever that we have rules and that we have rules that are consistent because regulatory fragmentation plus crisis creates major problems for keeping digital trade flows open. Uh, and so I think this is an interesting chart that suggests there's the beginning of con convergence um, and the hackathon details uh, give you more details uh, uh, on that in the handbook. So let me stop there. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Deborah. I mean, I, when I look at the slides that you have in front here, yeah, I mean, one, one of the issues is actually implementation, right? Because uh, I see, for example, in the ADPA CPTPP, it's paperless trading is there everywhere, right? But as you were mentioning, I mean, uh, we saw during the COVID-19 crisis that uh, implementation is lacking in many of these areas, right? It's a real uh, problem. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think it's partly because governments, they like to say things like, you know, yes, we should accept electronic signatures. Then you go to be involved in your court case and you discover that actually their version of electronic signatures being accepted and my version of electronic signatures being accepted is two different things. So we have some inconsistency in terminology and we have a lot of inconsistency in application. So even if we have the same rules, our ability to say that those are consistent and they're actually enforced and implemented is, is in fact lacking. So it's not just having the rules, it's following the rules and, and making sure that we do so in a consistent way. So there, it, this is hard. I mean, you know, trade is hard in general and trade in crisis is even more challenging and tr trade in a fast moving digital space is also challenging. But I don't think we should sort of throw our hands up and say, well, you know, we can't get it right. Let's not do it at all. No, we need to start, you know, keep moving and move maybe faster than sometimes we're comfortable with just because, you know, the speed of change is, is fast and, and we need to have this in place before the next crisis hits. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. So let me move to, um, to our last panelist, uh, Mr. Bipul uh, Chatterjee. So last but not least, uh, he's the executive director of CUTS International, uh, leading global public uh, policy think uh, and action tank on trade regulation and governance. I think many uh, participants are very familiar with, with the work of CUTS. Um, so maybe Bipul, uh, could you um, uh, let us know your, your view um, on, uh, on this issue of uh, tailoring provisions um, uh, of, of trade agreements, tailoring them to crisis, right? Based on, on what you've heard from the handbook and what you know of the handbook, and also maybe giving us a little bit of the development, sustainable development angle uh, to this, right? Uh, thank you, people. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, let me begin with by congratulating you and Catherine in particular for taking this initiative for all the work which you have done over the last year <clears throat> coming out with this handbook. I think it has uh, come out very well. Uh, let me begin my presentation uh, with uh, a point or rather underlining a point which has been made by Steve about the value of this work. 
So this is the first time we are facing this kind of a pandemic situation uh, in the century now. So we don't know how to deal with this pandemic situation in respect to in the context of trade. So this handbook is very, very valuable in that respect. So going forward, this is not the first time we're going to see this kind of a crisis situation. The scale may be different uh, in, the, in, in, in respect to its, uh, what you call its scope or its geographic limitations. But going forward, I am sure that we will face similar situations, particularly in respect to health and food. That's another very important subject which we should remember. Having said that, I'm going to uh, deal with a couple of important points, which I think this handbook has already covered, but it's important to flag them. First is, who are the most vulnerable groups of population or the sectors who are affected by this pandemic and who are likely to be affected as a result of crisis like this? We need to understand that we are almost one of, uh, more than one and a half years of the beginning of this pandemic. It began with a supply side shock in respect to various economic activities. And in fact, it then got spilled over to the demand side. Uh, I remember that sometime last year, in March, April last year, Angted has published a very important, very useful report, which shows that how this supply side shock is going to impact various sectors in different economies of the world. And that shows that even a relatively closed economy like India is going to be affected hugely as a result of this supply side shock. So who are the, which are the particular sectors which are going to be most affected? I think it's the micro, small and medium enterprises because they are largely dependent, many of them are largely dependent on imports as their intermediate imports. So one thing going forward, we need to keep in mind that what are the possible alternate supply chains that we can develop for a period of time? So one plus approach or plus one approach is something which has also come in, in this handbook very, very clearly. That is something we need to work on much more, uh, uh, in much more depth, I would say, in, in the future. Second group of is, is consumers, because primarily consumers are not an organized group of people. I mean, this very much. And if you look at this one and a half years, we have in the initial stage, the problems primarily arises as a result of information asymmetry. All kind of information asymmetry is there. So our my point is that actually we are dealing with unknown probabilities, which means that we are dealing with a lot of uncertainties. Today, I mean, more or less, we are dealing with known probabilities. That means we are dealing with risk, not uncertainties, which is not good, but better than, less bad than dealing with uncertainties. So how can we empower our governments, our various stakeholder groups to deal or to better deal with the risk of this kind of crisis? That is something which we need to emphasize on. And I think this handbook is going to be very, very useful for that purpose. Uh, I think we lost Bipul. Let's see if he comes back. Sorry about this, I mean, this internet is I coming. Think, I think maybe switch off your video uh, so that we'll, you will have, we will hear you better if possible. Yeah. So going forward, I think the value of this handbook is to see to it that I'm sure that Ian and other colleagues are going to work on it. They've already started working on it. We have to convince the regional economic communities about making necessary changes in the, in the trade agreements there. So if we can at least convince a couple of them, I think that would be a good start in, in years to come. Having said that, let me also deal with the uh, sustainable development aspects. And here I would like to make a point that 
This is very, very important, given the fact that climate change is a reality. It's not just an academic exercise. We're already seeing a number of crises as a result of climate change. The scale, as I said before, may be different. The geographic scope may be different, but the crisis is there. And it is in this context, I think we need to understand the value of sustainable development. And it's not just about environment. It is also about our economy. It is also about our equity. So all these things have to be taken together carefully and we need to come out with a positive agenda to deal with the sustainable development challenges, primarily coming arising as a result of uh, climate change and other inequalities, which is again an, a, an effect of this pandemic uh, in, in going forward. So let me stop here and thank you once again for, for this initiative. Over to you, Yann. Thank you uh, very much, Bipo. I mean, it's good to, to put this uh, work also in a broader context, right? And so uh, climate change is uh, the next crisis or the, the uh, possibly the most important ongoing crisis. Uh, if you read the latest reports, uh, scientific reports on the matter, right? Uh, so to what extent, in a way, the, some of the material in the handbook can apply uh, to uh, a crisis uh, like the climate uh, change crisis, I think would be something that is interesting. Uh, and maybe something that can um, uh, that, that can be that can be addressed right in the next step of the of the global initiative. Uh, in fact, let me uh, see uh, open the floor for for questions. Uh, there is a few questions that have been uh, that we've received. Uh, I'm mindful of the time uh, because I understand that we stop exactly at uh, 4 p.m. So we have only eight minutes, right? Uh, so maybe uh, let's let's quickly go through some of the questions that I can see uh, on the on the chat, right? So there was one question for Katrin on um, uh, about the baseline plus options provided in the handbook, uh, and the question was, could you please elaborate a little bit on what provisions uh, can be used to ensure implementation of those uh, uh, baseline plus? Uh, provisions. And so I think that relates to some of the discussion that we had a little bit before on implementation. Right? Uh, Catherine, if you can uh, try to answer this in one or two minutes, that would be great, <laughs> or less. I'll try to be very quick because I think that you've already referenced what I was going to, to go back to, which is that we did talk about this already a bit in the, con in, in the context of trade facilitation. It also came up in the digital context. I, so implementation is certainly a challenge, I think, across all of these areas. And what we tried to do in the handbook um, is highlight where there might be implementation challenges that come up and what some of the approaches could be to try to anticipate where those challenges might come up and how the rules could be shaped in that context. So this was, I think, on trade facilitation also saying, you know, we have to go beyond just the words on paper, but to something that's going to really facilitate real change in practice. And sometimes that might be like prioritizing something, making sure that do paperless trade or electronic signatures you know, could happen in the first instance rather than just being an option that could be added on with something else. That might be one way of doing it. Um, sometimes it might be a way of really trying to anticipate what some of the particular needs would be. So that would be my quick answer, but it, this is something that we really try to integrate across the handbook. And I think, again, an area where we need to continue to do further work. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, so maybe a trick question, actually uh, not an easy question for Stephen uh, that I see in the chat here. Could you please elaborate on how RTA provisions uh, can enhance the enforcement of uh, transparency? And transparency, transparency is one of the things that you highlighted. Uh, do you have maybe a suggestion of a specific transparency provision, I guess, or, or something along that line that you would like to? Well, look, look, it's 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 really the sixty-four thousand dollar question, right? Okay. How do you how do you make these nice looking words on a piece of paper uh, come to life? I, you know, I I think it's I think it's a question of will, and I think it's a question of making sure that look, if push comes to shove. Dispute settlement procedures can be initiated over failure to honor the transparency provisions, just in the same way 
it would happen if you weren't living up to the tariff reduction commitments that you made. I think, I think subconsciously people have just regarded transparency somehow as less important. Kind of looks nice on a piece of paper, but we don't have to take it that seriously. I think we've got to create a mindset shift. And if that means you know subjecting it to dispute settlement and then aggressively pursuing it when people fail to live up to their transparency commitments, I think it's important enough in a pandemic that we have to at least consider step like that. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. I mean, actually, I think it's uh, it's uh, very relevant. I mean, the dispute settlement we haven't discussed it too much, but obviously, in RTAs, dispute settlements and uh, mechanisms tend to be relatively weak, right? So it goes back mm -hmm. again to this issue of implementation. Yes. Uh, so uh, one underlying question would be then, you know, how do you actually boost also those disputes as dispute settlement mechanism in RTAs, especially if they become so large, right? Like we've mm -hmm. seen we've seen the CPTPP, the asset being mentioned. I mean, those things are ex extremely large. Uh, can can the rules be actually enforced, right? Through dispute mm -hmm. settlement. Right? Um, so thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Maybe let's go with Deborah next, right? Debbie, um, uh, let's see. So I'm just reading it out. Uh, I haven't actually uh, read it before. So thanks for your informative presentation on digital trade. As you mentioned, that digital trade is becoming pretty much uh, as broad as trade. Uh, among the many themes in digital trade rules, could you elaborate how capacity building uh, in digital area could help LDCs deal with the crisis? And I think you've made the, quite a good link already in your presentation mm. between the crisis and um, and digital trade, but if you could elaborate a little bit, uh, especially on capacity building, that would be. That would be good. So I think there's a couple of elements around capacity building that are that are very important. So one is educating officials, and it's not just in LDCs. I would argue it's almost every government needs more capacity themselves internally to manage digital, because there's often this huge disconnect between what many government officials think happens and then what business actually does. So getting more officials to understand how digital works is critical. LDCs and not LDCs, it really doesn't matter in my view. The second thing that's critical is having a conversation between governments and business, especially. I mean, you can have lots of other stakeholders involved, but those two are particularly relevant in digital because it's the stakeholders in the business side that are developing these new innovations or can identify where the rules are missing or where the rules are, are, are inconsistent. So that, that engagement is necessary everywhere, but it's particularly urgent under digital. Um, and then the third part is when you do that engagement, I would say you need to bring in more, more businesses. So not just the obvious suspects, because once digital is trade, then it means you need to bring in like lots of different kinds of businesses that are engaged in trade in not just tech, but in you know manufacturing and in small businesses and especially service sector in order to get a sense of what are some of the challenges that they face and how might those be resolved especially if we have certain kinds of crisis so now we're talking about a health crisis it, again it could be a natural disaster whatever it is are there particular provisions that make a difference and are there certain things that need to be guaranteed in a time of crisis that makes a difference Okay, thank you very much, uh, Debbie. So I think we are about to be cut off. It's three fifty nine. So let me ask uh, Bipul maybe for for one uh, last thing. Uh, if uh, is there any uh, missing issue or one issue that that uh, that needs to be addressed uh, in the future version of the handbook that you would like to highlight? And then I guess you may have thirty seconds to answer that question, Bipul. Uh, can you highlight one of the one issue that you would like to see more of in the next version of the handbook? Thank you. Yeah, I think how are we going to deal with crisis, I mean, not necessarily health related, but food related crisis as a result of climate change. That is something we need to look at. And related to that, that trade sanctions approach is not going to work. It has never worked and it's not going to work in the future. So how can we come out with a positive agenda, like in this case, this handbook? That is something we need to highlight again and again before the trade community. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bipul. I think uh, it's we're exactly on time. So I'm showing again the, the last slide here uh, with, uh, with the QR code for you to look at the handbook and the online course. If you uh, Thank you very much to uh, uh, Catherine, to Debbie, to uh, Steve, uh, and to Bipul, but especially maybe to uh, Catherine and Debbie because uh, it's 3 a.m. on one side for, for, for Catherine, I think uh, 1 or 2 a.m. now for Debbie. So very much appreciate uh, you staying on and coming on uh, for, for this event. And I look forward to working with you uh, 
uh, again uh, in in the future. So please, uh, time to go to bed maybe right at this point, right? <laughs> so have a wonderful night or, or day, depending on where you are. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.